Hello everyone. So today I'm in conversation with Justin Ku, who started out as a digital missionary with that Christian vlogger five years ago and has transitioned to I'm listening with Justin Ku. So welcome. Pleased to have you here. Thanks for having me. So my first question is very basic. So how would you define digital missions? Yeah, so I think that um, something that we understand in the church really well is mission work and and evangelism in a multitude of different contexts. We, for, for myself, for example, I started off as a literature evangelist, did that for about 10 years. And I think in the 10 years, I estimate that I've knocked on right around 100,000 doors. We understand what that looks like. Right. Uh, I know what it's like to work with a team of Bible workers. We send them out doing Bible studies in the community, or even hold like public crusades and Bible uh, evangelistic series and things like that. We even understand what it's like to send missionaries overseas. My wife was a missionary right. in the Philippines when she was doing a gap year in college. Right. And all of that's great and all that's super important. And I think we absolutely need more of that. But as we think about how people learn and how people consume information in a modern context, um, I think we can observe some pretty obvious trends where we're spending much less time in a library uh, and much less time talking face to face with say teachers or thought leaders even like pastors or um, Whoever else that we might have historically gone to for for information and for advice mm -hmm. What we're seeing now is that most of the times when we have a question That's we being everyone I think involved here whether it's something as simple as how to tie a tie yeah. how to change the tire uh, how to fix you know the dishwasher or when even when it comes to like a big life question yeah right. usually what we're doing is we're googling or looking up on youtube that question and so knowing that that's a trend and knowing that that's not even something that's going away but it's going to continue to increase as we move forward the question that i often ask myself is well who is there on the internet to solve some of these problems. Right. And some of these are mundane problems. Some of them are lifestyle oriented, like how do I cook the best vegan cake? I don't know, right. fill in the blank. <laughs> um, but a lot of times we see questions like, is God real? Or how do I study the Bible? Or you know, what is faith? These are questions that according to Google are being asked well over 100,000 times a month. And so I think it's imperative for us, those of us who believe that the church has answers to some of these really important questions, to be there for those conversations when those questions are being asked. And so uh, people like myself, digital missionaries, digital evangelists, we are those kinds of people who realize that, hey, the internet is how most people learn. The internet is how most people consume information presently. And we wanna make sure that we have a presence as Adventists when it comes to sharing our answers of hope and healing. Okay. So as we know, you know, digital evangelism is still in the beginning stages in the church. And, um, you know, we're more used to having the evangelistic series or going door to door. Um, and, you know, the Internet is still kind of a gray area in a lot of cases. So why do you think that the church is hesitant to embrace digital missions or digital evangelism? Yeah, I think that it comes from from a good heart. Yeah, uh, I think that most people in the church are doing the best that they can yeah. to be good stewards of the resources that God gives them. And I think built into that mentality um, generally means that we're risk averse. Yeah. We don't want to spend money on the latest trends or just kind of what's popping or what's hot right now just because, um, you know, there's a decent chance that in the next year or two, what's popular now might not be popular in the future. And, you know, for every, every uh, social media platform that is successful, there's probably a dozen that are unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And so dumping money into a particular social media platform can be seen as a poor investment mm -hmm. if, the, if the bet is off, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, it's kind of hard to ignore the importance of still being present in this space. You know, it, like I think in hindsight, we can look at things like, oh, Facebook? Yeah. Well, that was an obvious win. Yeah. Like we should have embraced Facebook back in 2005, 2006. Yeah. YouTube, when it first got started was, a place for cat videos right. <laughs> and, and you know lip singing videos and pranks and things like that. Yeah. No one would have guessed that YouTube would be what it is today, you know, over a year, uh, over a decade ago. So I think that the reason why we're so hesitant is simply because we don't know the future. And and yeah. I understand this impulse. Yeah. But I'd like to believe that 
the tipping point has been happening many years ago yeah. as far as social media as a general category is concerned. Mm -hmm. It is clear that the internet is here to stay. Right. It is clear that this is not a fad that's going away. Maybe YouTube in particular might not be here in 10 or 20 years, but online video is absolutely something that yeah. is here to stay. Right. Uh, in the same way that, you know, maybe early on, uh, publishing books or magazines, like if you think of 500 years ago, might have been seen as a trend. Yeah. It might have been seen as something that's too expensive to mm -hmm. invest in, and, and maybe rightly so. Right. But I'm so grateful that early on, um, the first book that was ever printed on the Gutenberg Press was, in fact, a Bible. Right. I'm so grateful that early on, even historically within Adventism, we saw that the publishing press was something to invest in. And I'm mm -hmm. sure it cost quite a bit of money mm -hmm. to buy those initial presses and to, to invest this money so that we could print literature and books. And I think about the early radio stations that were, were started and the early TV ministries mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. started. You know, we have a larger footprint due to our investment in modern day media. And I think it's, it's time, it's absolutely time for the church to say, you know what, the internet, social media, this is yeah. something that we will invest in, even though that there are some risks involved, but we see the scope of it. Yeah. Like talking about what I used to do as far as literature evangelism, right. it took me 10 years as an individual to knock on 100,000 doors. Right with the zero dollar budget and just with the the tools that god has gifted you know over the times that i've been stewarding these this this effort what took me 10 years to do takes me one month to do today mm. um i've only been doing the online ministry for a handful of years now and i've well i've well over reached five million people right. and that's not something that i could have ever done going door to door or right. doing bible studies or even preaching evangelistic series and so mm. the opportunity is there and the tools are there, and I think it's time for us to use them. Okay. So just um, another question about the role of the church in the digital space. So you mentioned sure. something interesting, which was that um, we need to be sharing our unique message as Adventists. So can you elaborate more on that? Yeah. So I think one of the general approaches that the church has had um, in the last decade or so when it comes yeah. to online content is this recognition that, you know, there's a lot of unsavory things on the internet. Right. Uh, there's a lot of videos and a lot of blogs and pictures out there on the internet that aren't really in keeping with what we would consider, um, you know, like a, a sanctified Christian experience. Right. And, and I get this, that's a very real reality. And, uh, and yet, the same thing could be said in any other medium that exists. Right. You know, just because there are adult themed magazines doesn't mean that the church should abandon you know magazines as a form of ministry just because there are television shows that aren't suitable for a young family you know oriented audience doesn't right. mean that we shouldn't have television ministry and in the same way just because books that are out there that are on witchcraft and sorcery or fill in the blank doesn't mean that we shouldn't print the words of scripture onto a book right and yet there seems to be this kind of uh, orientation, this inclination to say, oh, because the internet has a lot of dark things that are out there, then we shouldn't be present. And, you know, it reminds me of what Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Right. And I think that our That's approach, yeah, I think that our approach has unfortunately been one where we curse the darkness and run away Yeah. Be because we don't want to protect our young people. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, the internet is addictive. Social media has a bad influence on right. our children. And, and all of this is true. I'm not arguing that this is not the case. But given the fact is that, you know, according to the Wall Street Journal, young adults spend on average 18 hours behind a screen per day. Wow. Like crazy. Yeah. And if we do the math, that's 126 hours to every one hour that they're spending a week in church. Yeah. So given that that's the reality. Right. I don't think cursing the darkness and running away is something that we can feasibly do moving forward. Given that young people are present on the internet, I think that our, our challenge really as a church is actually to lean in, right. to light a candle in darkness, to be the light of, of the world and not to let our, our, our light just be hidden under a bushel so that no one can see it. No, no, Jesus encourages us. No, Jesus even commands us to go to the dark places with our light and to be the light of the world. And so, you know, I understand the inclination to, to withdraw. And while that might be really important for like how I might raise my own personal family or even my own personal practice, 
I think it's absolutely imperative for us as a church to be on mission, to be present where people are. And just the statistics don't lie. You know, what is happening on the internet is a very real part of most people's lives today. To deny that would just to be like the, the what is it, the ostrich putting our head in the sand. Yeah. Just being unwilling to, to, to reconcile with the reality that is today. Okay. Now, um, what is your honest assessment of how we as a church are doing in the digital space when it comes to digital um, discipleship? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. What 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 are we doing on the digital space when it comes to digital discipleship? Like like we're we're here in the Ontario yeah. conference and we're shooting these videos and right. awesome, like really yes. cool. Um, but as a communications professional, yes, you tell me what is the Ontario conference doing in the digital space? Uh, well, truthfully, we are we are using the digital space right now to show you know what's happening in our conference. I'd say that's one of the main things that we do. Right, we you guys got a, a newsletter, right? Yes, got we a, have an e a website, website. I'm sure you do mm -hmm. a handful of uh, videos, mm -hmm. and these are all great things. Yeah. Um, but if we look at those things, how much of that is meant for missions? Like, let me, mm -hmm. or I'll, I'll ask it this way: How much of what we are doing, mm -hmm. whether it's the Ontario Conference in specific, or yeah. the Church in Canada at large, or even the North American Division? How much of what we do on the internet is actually meant for the people that we're trying to reach and how much of it is meant for kind of housekeeping issues and, mm. and if I can put it slightly uh, aggressively, patting ourselves on the back. Yeah. Like how much of it is actually meant to reach people. Mm -hmm. And you know, not that I want to really like press on you and make you yeah. uncomfortable about it, but yeah. if I can just be bold in making a general assessment, yeah. I want to say that there's a large percentage of what we are doing as far as investing our time and resources that mm -hmm. isn't really mission mm -hmm. as much as it is maintenance. Right. And nothing wrong with maintenance. We need to maintain and we need to communicate with our constituency and all of this is important. But at the core of what Jesus called us to do is missions, mm -hmm. is to actually be there to spread the gospel. And you know, I just think that it's, it's somewhat uh, ironic that you know, now more than any time before do we have the ability to actually fulfill mission. Like I have in the, in the palm of my hand mm -hmm. with the press of one button, the ability to literally reach the world. And whereas it might have taken me time to, I've got, I've got to hop on a horse and carriage, to jump on a boat, to travel for months, to mm -hmm. go across the sea in order to deliver a message to nice. one person. Like with literally push of one button, I can reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people mm -hmm. in every corner of the world. Mm -hmm. And so given that that's the reality, again, like, well, what can we do about that? What can we do as a, a, a church conference? Right. What can we do as a local church? And even pushing it down even at another level, what can we do as individuals? Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started, there was no conference funding for this. Right. There still is no conference funding yeah. for what I personally am doing. And that's fine. Not that yeah. I, you know, I was a little bit bitter about that early on. <laughs> but, you know, I just kind of took my own challenge to heart. Like, hey, instead of criticizing, instead of just complaining what would it look like if I just sought to be the change that mm -hmm. I'd like to see in the church and so I just took personal ownership of it and so when it comes to digital discipleship I think that there there isn't quite a lot of things that I could point to and say oh this is an example yeah. of something that's going extremely well there are mm -hmm. a few things that I think are going well you mm -hmm. know um, there's the Center for Online Evangelism oh, yeah. which is a fantastic resource and I'm grateful mm -hmm. to actually be a partner of them okay. they are out there uh, trying to change the uh, the, I guess the internet's perspective of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists, as mm -hmm. if you've ever done this, I'm sure you have, you've Googled Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, Usually sure. the, the first articles aren't very flattering. <laughs> yeah. They're not <laughs> maybe even true. Yeah. Um, and so the Center for Online Evangelism is, is really making movements to, to do a little bit of PR work, which I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, there's other ministries that I'd love to, to mention, like the Haystack oh, yeah. out of the North American Division is mm -hmm. a fantastic one. I believe Bible is fantastic. Mm -hmm. My friend Caleb, who runs Humans of Adventism, is doing fantastic work when it comes to storytelling right. about who we are right. as Adventists among this wide spectrum of Adventism. Um, and so there's a lot of things that have been started in the last, let's say, three or four years that are mm. absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, much more could be done and much more needs to be done. Right. So um, are there any individuals out there, you know, you, when you started with that Christian vlogger, 
um, you were basically the only person in that space. Um, are there any others who you would recommend just for you know, Adventists wanting Adventist content on, um, on YouTube? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, five years ago when I remember searching for Adventist YouTubers, I, I couldn't really find any. Mm -hmm. There was one guy who was based out of Poland, oh, yeah. uh, Bible Flockbox, and he's been yeah. kind of the one blazing the trail as far mm -hmm. as I understand, but he's pretty much the only person that I could find at that time. And, mm -hmm. you know, five years later, as I'm looking for it now, there's maybe three or four ministries that are out there on the internet, mm -hmm. but by and large, this is a wide open field that I think mm -hmm. many more people need to be. You know, I think about what uh, Ellen White was saying about uh, the publishing ministry in her day, where there's one, there needs to be a hundred. Right. And I think that if she was alive today, she would absolutely be saying the same thing in regards to uh, online ministry. Right. Now, um, that's an interesting point. You know, Ellen White wasn't around during the time of, of online ministry, but... Yeah. Are there any biblical references you can give us about um, social media in their day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, if Ellen White was here today, she yeah. would absolutely be on social media. Mm -hmm. I think if Jesus were, was here today, he would absolutely yeah. be on social media. Like, it might be a weird way to look at it, but I, I often think about how the Bible came to be. Mm -hmm. You know, John on the island of Patmos. Yeah. He's stranded on this island and can't, like, physically go to a church, can't be there to give a sermon. And right. even Paul, when he's writing these letters, he's writing the modern day equivalent of social media. Right. He is writing a letter, or we could use language like a blog, yeah. and sending it to a church for them to con uh, consume this content. And he's not even there presently. He's not even there in the mm -hmm. flesh. And so, you know, I, I understand that what we would call IRL or in real life ministry is super mm -hmm. important. And there's, there's really nothing that can replace the human touch. Yeah, and what, it, you know, the experience of looking at someone eye to eye and, yeah. and be there in the, in the same physical space. And that's super important. And while that's the case, you know, that's not the only way that we see ministry taking place. Right. If Paul never wrote those letters, we would not literally, we would literally not have the Bible. Right. Um, and so, like, I see that as a great example of embracing a multitude of different approaches to mm -hmm. getting the message out there. I'm not trying to say mm -hmm. that we should only do digital right. and we should destroy every church and sell mm -hmm. them and use the money to create more, you know, content on the internet. No, 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 not at all. I think we should absolutely have church communities. Right. We absolutely need thriving, you know, bodies of believers that come together regularly to worship and to encourage each other. And while that's the case, we also need to be intentional about the people that are out there that might not ever be able to, mm -hmm. to attend in person. I mean, some of the low-hanging fruits, even in our own church community, what about some of the elderly or the shut-ins who right. are unable to physically come to church anymore? Yeah. Do we just abandon them? Right. Well, of course not. We can send our pastor to go and visit them, but we can do more than that. Yeah. We can share content with them. What about the young adult who leaves our home church and goes to college in another state, mm -hmm. maybe in a place where there isn't really any Adventist presence or they can't right. find a church community. Yeah. What, what can we do for that person? But even like broadening our perspective, I remember getting a message once from a 13 year old girl on my channel and she wrote in asking the question, hey Justin, what do I do? Um, I, I, I'm, I, I love Jesus, but I'm the only Christian that I know mm. and there's no real churches nearby me. Mm. And you know, I'll admit I was yeah. a little bit kind of quick triggered. Yeah. Uh, I just sent a message really fast without really thinking about it okay. too much because my immediately thought is, oh, I'm thinking of somewhere like Toronto yeah. or I'm so thinking of somewhere like Los Angeles or New yeah. York, a city where there's a thriving group of people. Yeah. And so I just write this message back to her. It's like, hey man, you know, stop making excuses. Oh, <laughs> if you wow. just Google a church nearby you and you call yeah. them up, I guarantee you, that the pastor or the youth leader or a secretary or an elder or someone in the church would be willing to come and pick you up and bring you to your church. Mm -hmm. And so I just send this message feeling like, you know, this was the, the app, you know, the, the right and appropriate thing to share with mm -hmm. her. Well, she writes back and says, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't communicate effectively. She says, oh. I live in a Muslim uh, country. Oh. There are no churches nearby and oh. I'm literally the only Christian that I know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, like I totally misread this situation yeah. because for her, there is no Christian church. Mm -hmm. There is no body mm -hmm. of believers. Literally for her, her way of engaging with community is only through the internet. Right. Her way of learning mm -hmm. and being discipled and, and studying the Bible with other people mm -hmm. literally is through the Bible or sorry, it's through the internet. Right. And 
I'm not exactly sure how my content made it all the way to a Muslim country. Like right. that's, I, I don't understand the technology well mm. enough to describe it. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that God is using it. Right. And so, again, just this is what I want to really think is, is if, if we're only looking at the church or our ministries for our own local congregation, mm -hmm. I think we're missing some major opportunities. Every church can now start to minister in their community at large, yeah. their state or their province or even you know, the country or the worldwide. And so, right. so I think that this is just something that's super exciting and, and just another reason why we need to be spending more time investing in digital. Okay. Yeah, that really made me think of, you know, when you're doing digital evangelism, you have such a broader reach. You know, you're really limit, unlimited, I'll say. You know, you can reach the world. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that story. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just curious, did, um, did you ever interact with that young girl again? That was the last time I interacted with her. Okay. Um, so I don't know the conclusion of the story. And I think that this is part of what makes online ministries somewhat uh, unsatisfying, yeah. is that there's not a lot of like closure. Um, we can sow a lot of seed, but do we really get to see baptisms? It's usually one of the questions that yeah. I get. Like, okay, Justin, this is great. The, I see what you're saying. It's making a strong case for the importance yeah. of online ministry, but can we get baptisms? Can we get people coming to our physical churches? And and the answer is yes, I believe that we can. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. starting from there is kind of a backwards way of doing ministry. For example, um, ADRA, which is a ministry that we all love and cherish and is an important part of who we are as Adventists and our role out there in the world. Does ADRA lead to baptisms? Right. I mean, maybe it does. I'm sure it has. But is it like a consistent theme? Is it actually even what we're looking for when we do ADRA? No, not really. We're simply doing... Uh, or we're simply participating in this disaster relief ministry simply because this is what Jesus commanded us to do, is to right. take care of people, right? right. And it's just, it's just the overflow of our heart. It's our Christian duty, and we're grateful to be able to do it. And if along the way it makes us look good as Adventists and people yeah. want to join our church, then praise the Lord, and, yeah. and we're grateful for that. Right. But that's not what we're looking for. And the same thing could be true on a, on a smaller scale when we do a food bank. Mm -hmm. We're not doing mm -hmm. that really in the hopes that we're getting something in return. We're just giving right. because this is what we're called to do. And even the field that I grew up with, which was literature evangelism, right. do baptisms happen? Of course, we, we hear stories about that all the time. But most of the time, over 90% of the time, 99% of the time mm -hmm. that I'm a literature evangelist, I hand out a tract or I give a book out or any of those kinds of things, 99% of the time, I don't know what the result of that is. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm content to do it because I'm sowing seed. Right. And so when I think right. about like online ministry, this is exactly the same thing. We shouldn't be starting it only from the perspective of what do we receive? Right. What do we get? Because that's a very selfish, that's a very backwards approach to ministry. I believe people are blessed. I believe that people mm -hmm. get baptized. In fact, I have actually seen baptisms as a result. In fact, mm. next week, when I go home, yeah. we are baptizing someone who I met because of my online ministry wow. in my home church. So it can mm. absolutely happen, and it's a beautiful mm. thing that when it does. Yeah. But I want to. I would. I challenge myself, and I think to myself, what kind of content would I create to disciple someone, even if they never show up at my church? Right. Let's assume that they show up every week to be present in my online community, but never show up in person. And maybe they never show up to any church in person. What kind of content that I, could I create that will help them grow spiritually? That mm -hmm. will help them uh, have a better understanding of who Jesus is? Mm -hmm. who, uh, how, what kind of content that I could, could I create that will strengthen their faith and challenge them to live the life of a Christian, a life of service and mission? Right. And I start from there. Right. And I think if I start from there, that I'm actually more likely to create content that is meaningful to the world right. and actually more likely to reach people in a way that might actually cause them to come to my church right. and be baptized. So you mentioned that you want to be the change, basically, in terms of how the church is engaging with um, the, digital, the digital world. So what are some things that you are actually doing to try to impact um, you know, digital missions on a church level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, when I first kind of came across the idea of digital missions, and, and mm -hmm. here's why I, I it first came across my radar and why I was so excited about it. Yeah. Um, I was teaching at one of our Bible, Bible schools okay. that was run by the Columbia Union. Mm -hmm. So we were in Philadelphia. 
discipling a, a group of young adults who wanted to live on mission and give their life to the Lord and all these different things. And one of the young men that came through this program, his name is Michael, right. and he came across this one YouTube channel um, of this guy based in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy is not someone that you had ever heard of. Right. No big name, didn't have a million subscribers, was a very small, no-name YouTuber. And yet, this, this young guy was sharing his walk with Jesus mm. on the internet. And for whatever reason, Michael was so impressed with this young man's testimony that Michael not only decided to become a Christian, but he decided to become a Seventh-day Adventist wow. because of this YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And so I'm immediately just like, my eyes light up. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, this is incredible. I have never thought of the internet as a place to do ministry. And right. yet Michael is here right. in church doing ministry because of a single YouTube video. Right. So I'm like, okay, I gotta be a part of this. I gotta, I gotta, I wanna see if anyone else is out there doing it. And like I said earlier, there wasn't really anyone doing it. And so from the very beginning, God really gave me uh, a vision of two things. One, Justin, you should be a part of this. This is something you should do, okay, as a personal, sorry, you should do this as like a, a personal project. And mm -hmm. two, like this is something that not only needs to happen just here locally, but abroad. And so, you know, what I do as far as trying to raise awareness for this is mm -hmm. I run my own YouTube channels, right. have a couple, have a couple of podcasts, things mm -hmm. like that. But also, you know, I'm out there providing coaching and training for pastors okay. and churches. Right. Uh, I travel around the country, sometimes internationally, mm -hmm. uh, to teach on social media ministry, mm -hmm. uh, to provide training and, and coaching and things like that. And, you know, really beyond that, it's just advocating for other, other creatives. You know, what I'm seeing is that social media ministry is really kind of this grassroots movement. Right. Um, it's not really something that I'm seeing pushed from the top of our church structure down very okay. much. Though there are um, some administration that really get it and are mm -hmm. pushing it. Right. Um, but generally what I've seen is that uh, at the topper levels of our church, it's a little bit more skepticism still. Yeah. But on the ground level, young people are so on fire for right. media ministry. Right. Uh, even just in the last two or three years, dozens of podcasts yeah. have started up right. um, by Adventist young people. Most of them who work full-time jobs mm -hmm. and yet will work extra on top of that in order to create their own shows. That oftentimes, at the sacrifice of their own uh, finances and time, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a small number. There's been way more podcasts than anything yes. else, but a handful of blogs have gotten started, a handful of YouTube channels have right. gotten started. Um, but mostly right now, it's still a grassroots thing. And so just advocating for each other, supporting each other, yeah. whether that's financially, mm -hmm. that's uh, providing community. There's a lot of like Facebook groups of all. Mm -hmm. Here are all the podcasters of Adventism. And we yeah. all share advice with each other and mm. encourage each other and share each other's content and things like that. That's generally speaking what support looks like right now. But, you know, there's a couple places that it's really promising. Um, you know, I've heard of initiatives where they do like this kind of like shark tank style right. uh, support where, hey, if you got a great idea, come to this event and pitch your idea right. to this board of directors or whatever. Oh. And if you got a good idea, then funding can be awarded. I think that oh. that's a really great place to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the it would be awesome. I think I would love to see conferences and unions and divisions starting to create their own unique channels. Right. Um, and we're starting to see that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's great. Um, and while I want to see more of that, I think really where the strength of this is going to come, it really lies on individual members of the church. Okay. Uh, people who will say, you know what, this is something that I want to do. And we right. understand this. We know that pastors aren't the only people who are supposed to yeah. do ministry. That it's really, you know, the pastor will do ministry, but yeah. also the rest of the church really has a duty mm. to do this. And so that that's kind of just the example that I want to live by, the encouragement that I want to give to those who might not officially be employed by the church like myself. I'm not yeah. officially employed by uh, the denomination, but this is still something I consider very important. Okay, so um, if you can just expand a little bit, you know, you've talked about ways that the church can support digital evangelism. Can you give a few more you know, practical ways that, yeah, you know, yeah. it can become more mainstream, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so you're asking how can the conference support 
independent creators or how can this conference support digital missions as, as a whole? As a whole, including independent creators and encompassing like doing their own digital yeah, missions. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, for most conferences, they're, they're kind of understaffed in the yeah. area of communication. Right. They might have one communications person, right. maybe two that are in, in a local conference. And I understand that budgetary limitations this is a challenging thing, but I would encourage uh, local conference, <coughs> excuse me, local conferences to allocate much more funding for this right. type of thing. Right. And here's the perspective that I would put in it. You know, you you we understand what it's like to put budget aside for a pastor, and you know you know the math as a as a conference employee, um, what that looks like for a salary, yeah. benefits, travel budget, the entire thing. It can be a mm-hmm. substantial package. And then you think about, well, what does it cost um, to rent? or to buy a church. There's another right. massive uh, cost that's involved yeah, there and absolutely. then operations is another thing. So there's a, there's a large sum of money that will be invested in a local church and rightly so because church is important. But just think about the amount of money that is spent in a local church compared to the amount of people that it serves. Right. So average church size in, in North America, what, maybe 150, mm-hmm. give, or, give or take 50 mm-hmm. on either side. Um, and that's good. But if we were to take that exact same amount of money and invest that exact same amount towards online ministry, you could literally reach 10 to 100 times the amount of people. Right. And so I would think of it, begin to think of it in, in those terms. You know, we, we, I've, I've seen, I've seen uh, events that have been run by the, con, uh, by the church before. You know, whether they are youth events, we do a retreat, we rent a venue, or it's an evangelism conference, or it's a pastoral conference, and sometimes these conferences can cost tens of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. But what if you put that money towards reaching people on the internet? I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in my home conference, the Oregon conference for right. a high school retreat. And it was right. a beautiful event, very well done. The people who executed it did it exceptionally well. And while that's the case, they spent all this money and they brought in, I wanna say like 300 high school students, which is right. fantastic. The same message that they invited me to come and share to 300 students, I then uploaded, because I recorded it myself, right. uploaded to the internet. When only 300 people saw it, with, this, with a zero dollar budget, thousands of people got to mm. see the exact same message. Right. So I'm not trying to suggest we shut down every church, but I am yeah. trying to suggest that we allocate more money for media ministry. And so right. what that could look like in an immediate sense is, hey, bring on a, a dedicated digital missionary for your conference, someone mm. whose role is to create content for a t- particular target demographic. What would mm. it look like to bring a digital youth pastor onto the conference mm-hmm. whose job is to create content for the Gen Z? Right. And a young adult digital pastor whose job is to create content for the young adults. And right. then not that it's just a young person thing, but even what does it look like to reach you know, our boomers and our mm. Gen Xers or fill in the blank. And so mm-hmm. I'd love to see that. First step, allocate resources at a local conference level so that you can actually do this at a local conference level. Second thing I would say is I would really encourage the conference to, to, to keep their ears open, uh, to keep their fingers on the pulse of what's happening on a ground level. Right. In, in every conference that's out there, there are a handful of mm. people who are of their own accord creating content already. Mm-hmm. So let's say you can't allocate a couple hundred thousand dollars right. for your your uh, media team. Cool, I understand that. But what would it look like for you to join and to support someone who's already creating something? Mm. And that support could look like in a couple different ways. What would it look like for you to just show up and be a voice of support? I think that's already something that would make a big mm-hmm. difference for a lot of online creators. Mm-hmm. Um, what would it look like for you to provide mentorship and help in that type of a way and say, hey, you know, we see what you're doing and it's fantastic and we want to be there to support you. How can we assist you? Um, maybe it's providing funding so that this person can go to conferences to learn more about their trade. Mm. I've been to conferences or I've invested my own money, sometimes three or four thousand dollars to show up to a three day conference. I've spent right. money for coaching for myself, sometimes five hundred dollars per hour huh. for coaching from some of the industry experts. And that's a luxury that I've had simply because I have a wife that's very supportive and she's willing to live very simply. And so we just mm-hmm. pay our own money. to to grow and to learn. What would it look like Mm. for the conference to say, hey, if we gave you $1,000 to grow, what would you use it for? 
Right. Maybe you need money to, 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 to go to this event or to buy this uh, mm. training course or what would it look like for you to even upgrade your equipment? What do you need? We have a, a, um, a shooting facility available and equipment mm -hmm. that you can borrow. What would that look like? And then beyond that, like if we want to get even down the level, like where it would really make a big difference, what would it look like for the conference to support like financially? Giving them a stipend. We understand what it's like to give a Bible worker a stipend. Right. What about a digital Bible worker? Giving them a stipend. Not that it's a full-time job. They'll yeah. still have to work and right. have their own trade. And I think that's, that's important because right. it, it keeps them in touch with the quote-unquote real world. Yeah. But giving them a stipend to support. Like I think about when I first started, how much even $1,000 a month would have changed so much. If I'm honest, yeah. right now, even $1,000 a month right now would change so much for me and my yeah. wife and, and what we're trying to create. Right. You know, with, with the content that I'm creating right now, it's, it's no small investments. Right. You know? I'm, I, for example, I started a brand new show recently called I'm Listening, where I'm mm -hmm. spending time interacting with non-believers. Right. I'm interacting with the kinds of people that our church doesn't reach, with atheists and agnostics, with literal pagans and Wiccans and you know, polyamorous and homosexuals and fill in the blank. And I'm spending yeah. time with these people and we're seeing a dramatic results and, and amazing relationships are being built and, and bridges are being built between these communities where the church doesn't have access to. Mm. And I'll give you an example. The first episode that I shot was with a, a YouTuber who goes by the name The Raging Atheist, <laughs> right. who made some really like unfriendly videos about me attacking me as mm. a person of faith on the right. internet. And we've been having a relationship now for almost two years. Mm -hmm. And this last summer, I actually got to go and meet him. Turns out the Raging Atheist actually lives in Battle Creek, Michigan. Wow. <laughs> and so like, here's someone who's in our own backyard, but the yeah. church isn't reaching, isn't okay. ministering to. Mm -hmm. And yet because of the internet, like not only can I have that opportunity, but I'm received well with open arms and a hug. And I can yeah. spend like an entire day with him and I shoot this episode where we get to talk about his journey yeah. and his life and everything else like that. That one episode yeah. cost me personally about $2,000 out of my own pocket. Wow. I had to buy a flight. I had to rent a car. Mm -hmm. I had to hire a videographer to film the entire thing. And then there's mm -hmm. the editing and all the work that's involved in producing this episode. Right. And I'd like to believe that when you watch the episode, you'll say, oh, this matters. Like this is... This is something that we need to see more of. And, oh, and this yeah. is why I'm so willing mm -hmm. to invest in it. But, right. you know, most of us, this is just a case study. This is an example of how most of us who are creating content on the Internet are doing it at a sacrifice. Why? Yeah. Because we believe in it. And, and I'm happy to continue doing it. I'm, I'm not, this isn't like me complaining and saying, I'm going to quit if no one supports me. No, no, no. I'm committed to doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue doing this whether the church supports me or not. This is just something that I've, I've mm -hmm. settled already. Right. But what can, the, what can the conference do? It can support in this way. Share the content. Get the mm -hmm. word out there. Help mm -hmm. other people find it. Right. Um, support them through encouragement and support them through, through even finances. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Um, and I'll just say that I did see the video and it was oh, awesome. definitely um, eye-opening. What, what, what did you think of it? What stood out to you? Um, what stood out to me was that, you know, when the... the atheist I don't know his name Ronnie sorry. is his name Ronnie yeah um, <clears throat> you know he said he had grown up in a quote-unquote Christian household but, <laughs> right um, you know they were drinking they're doing drugs all oh this man crazy yeah. stuff was happening robbing people and all yeah. kinds of crazy things he was in a, he was in jail he mentioned yeah. but um, you know it took like it says somewhere in the spirit of prophecy I don't re recall where you know that um, there's no greater tool, let's say, paraphrase, for the gospel than a friendly yeah. um, Christian. Right. And he mentioned several times that, you know, he would be open to Christianity if he could meet more Christians like you. Right. And, um, and I just, that, that struck me a lot, you know, just how somebody could go from, I mean, he's still... He's still I an guess atheist. He's still an atheist, still an atheist, but at least he is he's open. He's yeah, more he's, open. He's not militant anymore. Yeah. He's not angry at God. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I think he shared with me that just is so encouraging. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a great example as why I'm so uh, invested in this. Right. You know, before he was very angry at God. Right. Very militant, assumed all people of faith were just this list of really pejorative adjectives. Yeah. And now he changes his mind on that. Yeah, there are some religious people that he would have, you know, beef with, as it were. But at the end of our time together, he says, you know what, Justin, 
I feel like I've made a friend for life. Oh, wow. And, and I give him a hug because I feel yeah. exactly the same way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love this man and I'm so grateful for our friendship. And, you know, I see God at work in his life. And I'm just being patient. Yeah. But I know what the end result's going to be. Oh, you know, I, I believe uh, that God is, is doing a work in his life. And I think it's abundantly clear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether that, that episode is for Ronnie, for the raging mm -hmm. atheist, or it serves as a case study for many of us who grew up in the church, but maybe feel ill-equipped uh, to be able to speak to our atheist friends and coworkers. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of the intent of this this particular show that I'm doing mm -hmm. is modeling what do these types of conversations look like? How do you speak with your gay friend? Right. How do you speak with your friend who just left the church? Or if you meet someone who's never read the Bible before and is literally a pagan who's in the jungles of uh, mm. Peru along the Amazon River on, an, you know, on a hallucination trip because of ayahuasca with his shaman, mm. like real story, this is episode <laughs> three in my mm -hmm. show, this is the guy getting baptized this coming week when I wow. go home. <laughs> How do I minister to a pagan? Mm -hmm. And what do I say to him when he tells me this dramatic story of him taking this hallucinogenic drink and then mm -hmm. his soul tra transfers out of his body and he's wow. flying among the cosmos and he's like having this psychedelic experience. Right. And you're just sitting there like, I was not prepared for this. Like <laughs> they never taught me about this in, in, in academy or pathfinders. Yeah. Like Sabbath school did not prepare me for this. And like, right. that's how I felt. Right. And yet, being able to lean in with a listening ear yeah. and to be there for them, like this is, this is what can happen and, and seeing mm -hmm. the transformation that takes place. Yeah, so something that um, struck me as well was Ronnie said, you know, that patience is, is really important. Like if you mm -hmm. are, yeah, I guess you're trying to maybe get someone to, to open their mind to, different, to a different belief system, you know, be patient. So finally, you know, what are some best practices that you've discovered in your journey that you can share with um, the church in terms of digital missions? Yeah, I would say that the first thing uh, really is more of an attitude thing. Yeah. And my, my suggestion is be willing to fail. Right. When I first started my YouTube channel, I simply told God, all right, God, I'm going to give you a one-year commitment of my time. Mm -hmm. I will make sure that I post a new video once a week for an entire year. And right. what that looked like, to give you context, I never took a video editing course. Right. I'm, I never took a graphic design course. I was literally like on YouTube, <laughs> how to edit a mm -hmm. YouTube video, watching the video so that I can create my own video. Mm -hmm. So I was completely inexperienced right. when it comes to social media ministry. Mm -hmm. But I was willing to put my efforts out there and I was willing to fail and say, hey, you know what, I tried it for a year didn't work this time through, maybe it means that it's not for me, okay. or maybe it means I should try something different. I didn't know what it would mean, but I was willing to try. And I think because of that willingness to fail, mm -hmm. I actually got started. And I think most people are, are, are really hesitant to start because they're afraid of failing. Right, right. Failure is okay. Failure is how we learn. Mm -hmm. We understand this in every other context of our life. Mm -hmm. If you were afraid to go up to bat, like say, like literally baseball, you're afraid to miss, well, you'll never get started. In fact, the world's best baseball players, and I know I'm in Canada, so baseball's not as big here in, in Canada, <laughs> but the world's best baseball players yeah. fail over 50% of the time. Right. The ones who make millions and millions and millions of dollars fail more times than they succeed. Right. And that's just mm -hmm. true in life. So being willing to fail gives you the courage to start. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I would really begin with. Right. Start something. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if it fails, but grow and learn from there mm -hmm. and then keep growing and learning. Right. So just have the courage, get started. Done, in my opinion, is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is, like, not only does he use it, but he grows you and makes it better. Like, thankfully, I'm, I'm not as bad at yeah. creating content on the internet as I was when I first started. There's mm -hmm. a growth that takes place. Right. Um, but it all starts with that courage to begin. So thanks, Justin, for being willing to stay with us this extra day and just share with us your wisdom that you've gained over the, the past five years. Absolutely, my pleasure. And thank yeah. you to you and everyone else on the team. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that are here in this room. But thank you all for, for the work that you guys do. and the, and. And for, for blazing this trail and mm -hmm. for being willing to lean into this and ask these types of questions. What are we doing and what else could we be doing and, and where is God working? I appreciate it very much.